Yeah. All right, welcome everybody. My name is Adam Bratton with Human Powered Movement. Uh, we are about to kick off another Rec 101 session, and we are here at Recover HQ with Bill Johnson, founder and president. They're obviously supporting this session, uh, this whole series, and we're super excited about it. So thank you, Bill, and uh, let them know why this is so important to you guys. Yeah, well, we're really excited for this programming. Um, as you know, the outdoors have always been a really important part of our brand. Um, mm -hmm. Company was literally started out riding bikes. We came <laughs> up with our business plan on backpacking and mountaineering trips. So providing more access to the outdoors is, is really a cornerstone of, yeah. of what we do and, and why we you know do it. So we're excited to be a part of it. Perfect, so stay tuned. We'll be doing these all throughout the year. Once again, big thanks to Recover and hopefully you'll learn a little bit. This is Recreation 101. This is a series we're going to be doing all year long, uh, Human Power Movement. We're just basically trying to give people the, the tools and knowledge, information to, to get them started in whatever level they're comfortable with, right? It's, you know, there's always a little barrier to entry of wanting to get into something new. And so hmm. we said, well, hell, let's, let's give them a little bit, a little nudge and, uh, and get them out, get them moving a little bit. So um, we'll get into why everyone's here, basically this guy uh in a second but um chris can you do me a favor and hit the right button on that you don't have a i don't have a clicker <laughs> no we don't we're not that high tech is this like hey the, there is this it is right now this person yeah no nah, you don't have to be no Bri uh, bring brian will do it maybe we'll just do a we'll do like a musical chair um no you're good um so clinic hosts, well, everyone's just super excited to see my dumbass face up here uh, <laughs> as usual. But my name is Adam Bratton, uh, founder and head enabler at Human Power Movement. That is a self-given uh, title. Um, again, that's my goofy ass there. This is actually, I was telling Chris, this was the ride up to Pennsylvania. So, um, but anyway, been bikepacking for a while, not uh, nearly to the extent that this guy, again, we'll, we'll get into him later. Um, but, uh, but just kind of love doing this. It's, it's another way to get out, get moving, and, um, and just kind of see new places and experience new things. So um, actually, Chris, yeah, you mind hitting that again? That road looks flooded. You can just, you can just, there, you can just stay there. We'll get you another beer. We'll get you another beer. All right, the reason you guys are all here yeah. this yeah. evening, yeah. everyone's uh, favorite, Samuel Martin. Um, I'm going to give you a quick intro, and then we'll let Samuel uh, share a little bit about him. But um, Samuel, uh, he's got a couple of nicknames. Uh, one is Badass McGee. Uh, one is just recently uh, Captain Ultralight. So I'm joking around, but in all seriousness, when we're talking about like gear and packing and all that kind of stuff, um, you know, this is a picture of Samuel doing the um, the, the Tour Divide. So that's a 2,700 mile ride, literally the entire spine of the Rocky mountains in how many days? 25. 25 days. So literally for basically a month on the road, everything he needed was literally in that bike. So when we talk about packing. Well, not everything I needed. But not everything you needed. Yeah, there's I a lot know. of emotional things that needed along the way. But anyway, Samuel, tell them a little bit more about yourself, if you don't mind. And thank you yeah. for coming out and sharing with us. Absolutely. Um, so I didn't jump into backpack or bike packing cold. Um, I really came to it through my love of, of backpacking and, and hiking, um, which started in high school and it just sort of evolved into um, distance and sort of endurance events, I would call it. So like hike the um, PCT? Yeah, so I hiked the Pacific Crest Trail in 2018 um, and that was sort of the first like multi-month, you know, adventure that sort of stoked the fire for these longer trips and and really gave me a crash course on what I needed, what I didn't need to bring on yeah. you know, the backcountry. And we, um, along with Wes, who's back here as well, we actually, this is where the, he, we got the nickname of Captain Ultralight, but we did a pack rafting trip in Alaska in August. And so, um, same idea. It's like, hey, everything you need, it needs to be multifunctional, it needs to be small, it needs to be packable, it needs to be you know, quality and all that kind of stuff. So we'll, we'll get into some of that stuff later. <laughs> so. Anyway, thanks again for, for coming out. Next slide. Thank you, Chris. Um, big thanks to our sponsors. Um, Recover is a, a local brand here, 100% recycled. This is one of their shirts. This is made from eight plastic water bottles. So eight of those water bottles are in what makes this shirt. So local brand here. Their whole idea, their, their company was founded literally when the founder bought a bike from another guy 
and they started talking about the idea of creating this sustainable apparel company. So big thanks to them. Um, Sierra Nevada is a big sponsor of ours, so we want to just kind of throw, throw some love. There's actually a bunch of Sierra Nevada stuff over here, so before you leave, make sure you grab a little Sierra Nevada goodie bag. Um, and then also a big thanks to Confluence for having us today. Super cool spot. This is like a, you know, there's art here. There's live music up here tomorrow night. Uh, there's obviously outdoor recreational opportunities and then everyone's favorite, there's a bar. So it kind of brings a little bit of everything we all love together. So big thanks to Confluence for having us. So real quick, we'll do a bunch of giveaways um, at the end, but I do want to do one giveaway first. And uh, same, if you don't mind pulling a, pulling a name from the hat. Oh, I thought the helmet was the giveaway. The helmet, well, <laughs> it could like, be. It looked a little old. But, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a little grungy here. So this is for a $50 gift card to uh, Recover. And this person, whenever this person signed up, I didn't get a last name, but Eric. Is there an Eric out here? Nice, oh, you guys. Good, we still have hope. Right. Sorry, Eric. If Eric comes later, he's gonna be pissed. He's gonna be pissed at us. Chris Trafari, boom. Well deserved. Put it back in. You're, you're the, put it back in? You're the, you're the clicker guy, do you want it? Put it back in, yeah. Put it back in. Chris, ironically, is, a, is an ambassador for Recover, so I think that's probably. <laughs> See, that's just Nepotism. You're spreading the wealth, man. <laughs> that's right. All right, next is Max, Max, Wes Maxwell. Boom. <laughs> I said, I'll take that. No okay. hesitation. All right, we'll get, uh, I'll, I'll, we got to get your email and all that stuff. We'll get it over to you. All right, so, but Chris, you're going back in the hat, in the helmet. That's fine. Uh, we'll put Eric back in there for now, but Wes, you're done. You're done. No, no more prizes today. That's all right. All right. Anyway, all right, cool. Just wanted, that's our icebreaker for the night. So from here on out, it's all serious. Okay, so serious faces, no smiles. Fresh all right, so here's basically a quick, uh, quick rundown of what we're gonna do. Obviously, we're gonna, you know, bike packing overview, right? It's, I was telling a couple of y'all earlier, it's, you know, my approach to it is it's just like running, right? Running can be anything from, you know, running down the street to catch the bus or running a, you know, a six day stage race through the Sahara Desert, which that's a race that's out there. It's all running, kind of the same thing with bike packing, right? It's all, it's basically a combination of cycling and backpacking. That can be mm -hmm. to your local park, or that can be like something like Samuel did. I mean, it doesn't matter, it's all part of this, this sport. We'll kind of go through a little bit of the differences of, you know, well, what's bike packing versus bike touring versus adventure cycling, all that kind of things. We'll kind of break some of that stuff down too. Um, to start this, I, I think it's a really good exercise, and this is how I kind of got into it, is to ask yourself some questions about what do I want to get out of the experience? Is it paved road, unpaved roads, all that kind of stuff? So a big part of it is understanding you know, what you want to get out of the bikepacking experience. Um, we'll also do a Q&A. This is obviously super casual, so if you guys have questions. But serious. Yeah, it's super serious, that's super right. Super casual, but serious. Super casual with a tinge of seriousness, yeah. <laughs> So if you have questions, obviously, you know, fire them out. We'll, we'll, we'll do a Q&A at the end. Hopefully we kind of stir some questions in your mind a little bit as we're going through some of this stuff. Um, as you can see, it's kind of what I was saying before. There's different distances, surfaces, styles, approaches, all that kind of stuff in biking. That's the beauty of this is it can, you can kind of make it whatever you want. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll kind of break some of that stuff down too. Um, obviously a huge part of this is gear needs and um, packing. So we've kind of rigged up some of these bikes. Um, I've also, that table over there, it's kind of the full display of what I took on the Pennsylvania ride. Um, so we can kind of go into some of that stuff. Feel free, we can, I can walk over there and show you some of that stuff too. Um, but you know, gear and packing is, is pretty critical in this thing. On the flip side, I'll show you this. This is literally, it's funny because it's a recover bag, but this is literally, this was my first bike packing bag. It's a backpack. Right, there's nothing fancy about this stuff. Um, I threw a hammock, um, hammock straps, extra pair of clothes, and I think like a little like Frisbee disc or whatever in this pack with three other idiots and we bike packed our first trip. It was an overnighter in the, down in the Florida Keys. So again, doesn't need to be all fancy. You can start wherever you want. Literally, mm. everyone's got a backpack, throw crap in there and, uh, and pedal off and, and check it out for yourself. Um, all right. Yeah, we'll end up with, with uh, some Q&As, so. All right, so I'm gonna keep blabbing and then we'll kick it over to Sammy here a little bit. This, I love this picture. This is actually like a perfect example of, you know, the combination of cycling and 
in backpacking. And uh, ironically, uh, Samuel took this photo. Samuel's also a professional photographer, as we kind of saw earlier. And so just a phenomenal, we, that's a whole nother topic. But um, Sam and I went on this really cool, just a quick overnight trip, but it was, mm -hmm. it was in a wilderness area. And so in wilderness areas, you're not allowed, it is legal to ride your bike. So we broke our bikes down, literally threw them on our packs, hiked down um, in the, uh, to the Linville River, mm -hmm. camped out at the Linville River. Um, there's a really cool picture later in the show. We had to traverse, there's a bridge out. So we actually, Samuel had, Samuel had scouted this. And, uh, and, and we knew we needed to literally set up a rigging system to like shimmy our bikes over across the river and then get back up out there. But anyway, so I love this picture because it is a combination of cycling and backpacking at its most purest form. Um, so generally, again, bike packing is um, unpaved surfaces. So mm -hmm. by definition, there's no, Webster's Dictionary does not have a definite, you can't look up bike packing on Webster's, it doesn't exist. Um, yes. But there's a, yet, thank you. Sorry. There's a lot of good resources. I've, I've put a bunch of um, resources up here later we'll get to, QR codes, all that stuff. So there's plenty of information out there for you guys to keep learning. But bike packing generally is on an unpaved road. Gravel mm -hmm. roads, dirt roads, mountain bike trails, single track, double track, all that kind of stuff. Bike touring is a little bit more on the paved roads, right? So again, that's kind of one of the questions you'll need to ask yourself is what do I want to do? Is it, is it do I not like driving on roads or biking on roads with, with other vehicles? Or, you know, am I okay with that? I want to cover distance. Those are kind of some of the differences, but bike touring is on paved roads. Bike packing is on um, more of the dirt surfaces. Um, generally involves more than one day, right? It's kind of like backpacking, right? It's, it's backpacking because you're going out and camping. You're not, if, if you don't do it overnight, you're just kind of going out for a hike, right? Same thing with this. Like you're, if you don't camp or you're not out there for a day, you're just going for a ride, which is totally cool too, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're bike packing. Technically, you could throw a bunch of stuff on your, on your bike and roll around if you want to, yeah. and there's nothing wrong with that. But uh, in this world, an overnight stay is really kind of one of the key features of it. Um, all right, I'm gonna stop blabbing for a little bit. Samuel, just give him a you know, different shapes, sizes, styles, all that kind of stuff, destinations. Just give a little bit of context as far as, you know, what the different styles of these type of, of adventures can be. Yeah, I mean, I think you covered it pretty well because I, I look at the three bikes that we have and they all obviously have a different use case right. when it comes to terrain, you know, texture of what you're riding on. Um, but you could easily bike pack on any one of those, yep. right? So um, the mountain bike, you're not gonna wanna take on the road. So <laughs> maybe more single track oriented, really rough terrain. Um, obviously you have challenges there when it comes to the gear you can put on mm -hmm. it and like the weight you wanna carry on it. Um, so it's not ideal for distance riding or like, you know, mm -hmm. if you have a big kit, you're not going to want to necessarily put it on a, a, a full squish mountain bike. But um, your gravel bike's a good example of mm -hmm. that off-road, capable on gravel, on mixed surfaces, on single track. But it also is limited when it comes to really rough terrain. You mm -hmm. obviously don't want to beat yourself up on yeah. a fully rigid, you know, I've done that before and it's, it's no fun. <laughs> um, and then you have more of like a, you know, traditional touring and or um, maybe a, 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 a softer surface bike mm. where, you know, you're not necessarily going to want to take that on rough gravel mm. roads either. Yep. So that's, you know, you still get a little cushion with obviously the, the front suspension. But yep. um, so that's where my mind goes is like, yep. what bike do I own currently? Mm -hmm. And where does that lend its strengths and weaknesses to the services and, yeah. and the, the places I can go? And we'll go, we'll go in a little bit more detail on some of the packing stuff that you're talking about is like, yeah, that the taking a, a full suspension mountain bike, obviously you're very limited on what you can do just from space and all that stuff. Um, we've got a hip pack here that is beneficial. If you want to, you know, pack up some more stuff, you don't have as much space on a mountain bike. You can go with the hip pack Carry or it. obviously a backpack. Again, we can kind of go into some of this stuff a little bit more when we get into that packing and gear and all that kind of stuff. Um, okay, next, next. Uh, so um, here's a couple of main questions. Again, it, it's super broad, it's super open. The sport is, can kind of be, again, whatever you want it to be. So these are just some of the questions that I start to kind of think about uh, when I'm saying, okay, cool, what do I want the, what do I want the trip to be? 
And so, you know, obviously there's 10,000 questions. This is not a comprehensive list. Um, you'll have to kind of go through your own thought process as you go. Um, but we'll break down each one of these, but I wanted you guys to kind of see, hey, cool, here's a, at the minimum, here's a, a, a quick checklist for you guys to say, cool, let me decide what I want to kind of do here. So again, we'll go to the next slide and, and we'll kind of break down some of the pros, cons of either one. Um, so again, paved or unpaved, I talked about this a little bit before. Um, I'll try and give you some context of some of these photos too, just I think it kind of helps tell that story. Um, this, the photo on my left, that, that's me. Uh, down at, obviously in, in Key West, that was literally the first bike packing tripping, uh, bike pack trip I did. You can see, I literally have two water bottles. I have uh, what's called a little gas tank. It's kind of just right on, right by the handlebars. And then, and then again, I took this backpack. Super straightforward. It was you know point A to point B on on a single road. It was Florida Highway One, I think, and it was just you know dodging semi trucks the whole way. <laughs> Camping out at the, it was Boyd's campground, I'll never forget it. We, we all strung our hammocks up all over the place and uh, spent a day in Key West and, uh, and then bike back. Um, super straightforward, logistics were super easy. Little did we, we weren't very good mechanics, uh, so we probably didn't plan ahead of time on that too much, but um, uh, a couple fish hooks and tires and stuff we had to, we had to, to kind of deal with. But um, so again, that was just straight paved road. Right, that was you know, simple, easy, straight to the point. The other picture to the right, that's obviously an unpaved road. That is a, that's on the Palmetto Trail in South Carolina, which is a great example of, and we'll talk a little bit about this, is that has everything, right? And the most times, these trips aren't just like Highway 1 down in the Florida Keys. Most times, these are covering different surfaces, um, a totally different environment. Sometimes you have access to resupply, sometimes you don't, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, you can be out in the middle of nowhere for, I don't know, you, on, on the divide, what did you see? I mean, there was probably times where you were just completely out of nowhere for a significant amount of time. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it all comes down to your pacing and your, ultimately, your, your, your route selective. But, yeah, yeah. There's, there's one or two days where yeah, you're, you're out there. You're out there. <laughs> um, so, again, paved or unpaved, again, the difference is bike packing is primarily unpaved, bike touring uh, primarily paved. So as Samuel was saying before, this kind of <clears throat> dictates the type of bike that you'll need. Again, if you're going to be covering multiple you know, surfaces, take that into account. I, uh, Palmetto Trail is a perfect example because you get literally everything. You get, I think it's, I forget what the mileage is, 350 or something. Mm -hmm. And it's like 60% road, just straight up asphalt. And then there's probably another, I would guess, 30% or so is on gravel forest roads, stuff like that. And then the final 10% is just straight up single track trail. So it's this, there's no perfect bike for it. And I can tell you, I've done the Palmetto Trail on a full suspension bike. I've done Palmetto Trail on that bike. And I've done a Palmetto Trail on a hardtail bike, which is, this is like a hybrid bike, but it's, it's a front suspension only bike. And they're two, they're all three were totally different experiences because they're different. There's deep sand, mm -hmm. there's asphalt, there's gravel, there's single track. There's all these things you have to go through and there's no perfect bike for it. So it's kind of tough. So you just have to think about that as you're, as you're kind of saying, yeah, what do I want it to be? If you're getting into it again, I would just say, Hey, start, start on the road that you're comfortable riding, throw mm -hmm. again, some stuff on a bag that you already have and just kind of see what you think. So that's kind of my, my recommendation. Um, you'll see here, I've also put some QR codes up here uh, later if you want to grab them, but two of my favorite uh, uh, resources for this is bikepacking.com and Adventure Cycling Association. Those are just kind of two of the industry leaders in e either of those spaces. Cycling Adventure Association is more on the bike touring side, clearly. Uh, bikepacking.com is very clearly on the, on the bike packing side. So those are two, two good resources that we can look up later. Mm -hmm. um, good. Um, I'm gonna let I'm gonna let Samuel take this one. Um, let me give you context real quick of the photos. Photo left is Samuel because he's a badass. Photo right is me because I'm a not a badass and I'm in a hotel room. Uh, so I'll let I'll, I'll let I'll let you take the uh, take this one. Uh, a quick uh, some of the quick pros and cons of, of both and, and you know, what yeah. the benefits are. There are certainly a lot of pros and cons to, to both of these. Big time. Um, I have slept in my fair share of, of uh, Airbnbs and, and <laughs> hotels on, on trips. Um, 
really what what I think about when I'm planning a route, when I'm looking at a trip, is I, I love camping, so my first choice is predominantly to sleep in a tent or you know sleep outside. Um, but it's always nice and to have in the back of your mind like the bailout plan mm -hmm. of okay if something happens what's my options mm -hmm. um, if weather just goes terrible you know temperatures plummet like what are what's out there um, so that's always helpful just pre-planning as you're thinking about the trip you're you're looking at your gear selection mm -hmm. um, but yeah as far as camping um, obviously when you're looking at what you can put on your bike, mm -hmm. a tent takes up a lot of space typically. Yeah. So I think there's a conversation there around what tent and or what shelter are you carrying because you don't have a lot of room on, on you know, a bike. Uh, um, traditional backpacking tents, ultralight tents, like those are, are typically the go-to for most people. So those are, you know, what, I, what I typically say is if you carry it in your backpack, you can pretty much carry it on the bike um, with mm -hmm. some exceptions and some obviously, you know, changes there. But um, my go to, as the photo goes, is is a tarp with a bivy, essentially, mm -hmm. uh, which works well in most conditions. Obviously, in the southeast, you know, humidity, you can get a little swampy. So I, I typically change that out depending on kind of what the weather looks like. But um, yeah, I'd say it's, it's, it's very easy to camp. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I think, the one thing that maybe people would, would take exception to is because you think if I'm on the pavement, it's maybe hard to plan where mm -hmm. you're stopping that night because of mileage or because of any number of, of you know, conditions. Um, but there's a surprisingly large amount of campgrounds out there. So even if it's like you're saying, just a, you know, a traditional RV campgrounds, mm -hmm. they often have a tent section you can roll up. Um, so it's, it's, and then, well, funny enough, um, I went on a bikepacking trip up in Vermont this past gonna, fall. I was gonna bring this yeah. up. <laughs> um, and we had these grand ideas of, of wild camping. We all had tents and shelters. Um, and yeah, we all had these visions of camping under these beautiful maples in the fall. <laughs> um, and it turns out it was a little harder to find proper camping out there um, just because of you know private property and and the pace we were at we were always wanting to eat dinner in town so like mm -hmm. we'd it'd be like eight o'clock at night and we're like oh we really don't want to leave the city and and do another you know 10 20 miles out of town um, so a solution we came up with which i don't necessarily advise but it's <laughs> you know keep it in your back pocket um, was baseball dugouts make a really good <laughs> see you know, yeah it's a it's a dry roof <laughs> nobody's out there at you know nine o'clock at night yeah you can roll up um you know there's maybe some like free uh little seeds on the ground <laughs> like, uh, Cap sunflower again, seeds again, captain ultralight over here yeah. uh but no like that's it ended up being a great option, yeah. and I think we spent two of the three nights in a dugout. Yeah. Um, and it kind of became a game of like, oh, there, you know, there's a, keep that in our back pocket <laughs> in case do we it. don't find anything else. So one thing um, I will say too on um, camping is if, if you are, um, or if you're planning on going to a hotel, going the hotel route, mm -hmm. which is, you know, you, can, you don't have to pack near as much stuff, you've got yeah. the conveniences, you can recharge stuff, you can Wi-Fi, you know, whatever it is, all shower. the conveniences, shower, like, and I've done that a lot. And that's, you know, that's, this was on Pennsylvania, the picture to the right is on the way to Pennsylvania. Hurricane Ian came through and completely blew up my camping plans. I had Samuel's very similar um, uh, Hyperlight Mountain Gear set up here, but that got blown up. So I had to go, okay, well now I have to switch my plans and get to hotels. If you're just going out and saying, hey, I'm going to the hotel and each night I need to make it to the hotel great idea but you have to then make it you don't have any camping gear at that point <laughs> yeah. right so like if you get stuck out where you have a mechanical issue or you know some some issue with your bike just make sure you understand the saying okay well i don't have camping gear i'm mm -hmm. not prepared for that so i need to make sure i get myself somewhere at the end of the day whether that be That's a dugout a or you know whatever <laughs> and at that point you're probably just trying to figure out how to get some sort of shelter so just something to kind of think about i've been on multiple trips where we were going living off the land which is packing light moving fast 
And that meant, everybody understood that that meant we had to get to that, that hotel at the end of the night. And that could mean mm -hmm. that, you know, you're pedaling until whatever time at night. And you won't, you don't, you know, you're ready for dinner, you're ready to stop riding, but it's like, well, you can't just be out in the middle of nowhere. So anyway, that's again, a that's a good, again, another reason why I think that's a good question to kind of ask yourself as you're leading up to this thing, just to kind of get a sense for, mm -hmm. okay, what am I mentally preparing for? Okay. okay, next slide, if you don't mind, please. Uh, backyard and back country. Um, again, I, I love this. I, I actually selected these photos specifically because I knew Samuel and I were going to be doing a back and forth here. This is my photo on the right. This is at a McDonald's uh, having breakfast in the middle of somewhere in Florida. This is where we were going hotel to hotel. Uh, I think we had dinner at the Cracker Barrel the night before. So this is, you know, this is how I apparently choose to do stuff. The photo on the right is Samuel's, uh, which you can't tell here on the on the video we put up. You'll be able to see a little closer, but like, there's what a lot of cows? Yeah, there's just <laughs> roaming cows in the background. It's like this beautiful like alpine meadow of wildflowers and stuff. I'm over here eating McDonald's and you know dead bean coffee. Uh, so <laughs> anyway, I'm gonna kick it over to Samuel. Just kind of you know talk a little bit about backcountry versus backyard again. I think it's kind of a fun little dynamic. Both are great, right, yeah. for the reasons but there's benefits and pros and cons to both as well. So, I mean, it really comes down to what you want out of the yeah, trip because yeah. I, on that Vermont bike packing, we had breakfast in town every day. Uh -huh. <laughs> I think we had dinner in town most days and it was incredible. Yeah. Like, you start the day with a, you know, you're not having to break out the stove and you finish the day without having to clean up, you know, your pot. Mm -hmm. um, but also on the divide, like, I so enjoyed just, mm -hmm not knowing where I was going to stop that night. Mm -hmm. And like that field presented itself at, mid, you know, at sunset. And yeah, there was a lot of cows and there was a lot of, I had to find the perfect spot with no <laughs> what you do know, you mean cow pies. Can you go into more detail on uh, that, please? It was, it was honestly hard. Uh, <laughs> there was a lot of cows out there. And they all, like, they, I went to bed and they were watching me and I woke up and they were still watching me. And I was like, <laughs> all right. That's creepy. <laughs> like, Just all right. don't, don't come over. Load up, um, we gotta get out of here. But yeah, it's, it's really, I don't, I don't look at it as, you know, I have to sleep outside or I have mm -hmm. to eat my own food every trip. Mm -hmm. I think it's really um, looking at each trip as, you know, what's the pros and cons mm -hmm. to um, carrying a little less food and spending an hour, you know, essentially not pedaling an hour earlier, mm -hmm. but going to a restaurant, grabbing something from McDonald's. Yeah. Um, so you do that too? You know, every now and then. Okay. Now yeah. I'm a big, yeah. Uh, I would say my travel tends to lean towards the back country mm -hmm. versus the, the front country because that's just what gets my you know spirits high and mm -hmm. it's what I love. Um, so that's I'd say that's always where I'd lean yeah. and I sort of just love that self-reliance and that being out away from the convenience of like mm -hmm. the fresh coffee like I yeah. kind of like the little hardship of like yeah. and it's not even that hard but like bursting the stove up, getting your water, filtering well, we, the water. We, 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 um, found, we found a trick for instant coffee too. So yeah. we think we've, but. So that's where, I, that's where I love to go, but you know, I'm not opposed to, yeah. and I, I, I love the simplicity of, you know, the casualness of, yeah. you know, going to the restaurant or, or and, and obviously making this it is, easy. Yeah, and this is a, you know, intro course. So it's like, I, I don't think anyone here is saying, hey, I'm gonna, check this thing out and then I'm going to go do the tour divide, right? Like I don't you think should. Like, yeah, you should, you should. Which that was actually your first kind of like true bike packing trip, yeah. right? Again, Captain Badass over here. But, but I do think like, again, start with whatever you're comfortable with, right? I mean, most people starting out are going to kind of, you know, they're not just going to go on this week long back country trip. They're going to kind of say, cool, let me, let me check out a shorter trip a day or two or whatever and get a feel for it. What do I like? What do I not mm -hmm. like? All that kind of stuff. So, Again, that's the beauty of it. You can kind of make it your own. I would say the, you didn't mention it, but like the, one of the most valuable meals in my opinion is like the lunch. Mm. Where it's like, you can still get up early, make your coffee, make your whatever, your oatmeal, same with dinner. But like, if you can have a good lunch somewhere. Yeah. That'll set you up for the, for the key. afternoon. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. well, hold on. We, we, we're not going into nutrition too much on this, but uh, Samuel also did the um, unbound race in Kansas this past year. He did the XL, which is a 350, literally 350 mile, just straight race. 
And what, what did you have to eat again? You said it was, it was something like, I need to eat all the time. I'm constantly eating. Yeah. Da, da, da. You, what did you have? So 350 miles over 25 hours. Yeah. I mean, it was mostly like Coke <laughs> and like Coca-Cola. Like Coca yeah, well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'll let you. Uh, um, mostly we had Q and A at the end. Hold on, we're gonna. <laughs> mostly Coke and uh, like Snickers and waffles. It blows my. And mind. like a donut at 3 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> Which was primo. Yeah, really, just riding. Like, try to stay high. So if we do a, a nutrition clinic, we probably don't. will not have Samuel yeah, don't. Uh, <laughs> as a part of that one. Don't. Natchez Trace Parkway. Uh, from Knox, or, uh, oh, Nashville, Tennessee to Natchez, Mississippi, 475 or so. Um, and we had a support van with us. Like literally this shot right here is like, hey, we'll meet you in Tupelo, Mississippi, 20, 30 miles, whatever, down the road. And we're going to stop for lunch. Mm -hmm. So we got coolers, we got drinks. I mean, we were just in the lap of luxury out there, right? So again, that's just a huge advantage if you're saying, look, we don't want to pack up all this stuff. We just want to, you know, see how fast we can do this. You know, that's certainly something to uh, to keep in uh, or, to, or to think about. We had extra, you know, extra wheel sets in there. Again, you got everything you needed, right? The driver was going to the damn grocery store and resupplying for us. I mean, it was just, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of logistics are out of the way if you can kind of set that up. Uh, but again, that may not be what you want to do. Photo on the right, one of our uh, one of our friends, Jesse Hyde, who was up in Vermont with um with sam this is on the palmetto trail again and we were this was a self-supported thing where we were completely on our own and he was having all kinds of issues with some flats and so we were stuck out there and literally had to hit we couldn't get it fixed and, the, and it was you know a couple hours after sunset so we had to hitchhike and some drunken dude well it turns out he was hammered picked us up and drove us into a little town where we could like get some get some help and but that's kind of part of it. We're like, we're on our own. We don't have, we can't just call up the sag wagon and say, hey, you know, let me drop a pin at our location and come pick us up. So, you know, we'll get the bottom point is pure freedom, right? That can be a good thing or that can be a bad thing. That's, you know, that, that's part of it. So that's just kind of a, another aspect to think about, you know, if you have someone that wants to be, ride sag with you, it's a big benefit if that's not what you want. And just kind of be thinking about how you can get yourself out of situations if you find yourself in them. No. Samuel, did, I mean, that was unsupported to divide, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's, that's a pretty significant underhaul. But Samuel knows how to get out of the situation. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so far. Anyway, yeah. Uh, as of now. All yeah. right. Next slide, please. Um, again, another quick one here. Again, same thing. I love this photo on the left. This was, you know, we we took our time on that. It was we were out for I think 25 hours, 26 yeah. hours or so. And we only covered 30, maybe yeah. 40 miles at the most, but it was just the most amazing scenery the whole way. You're in the Linville Gorge, you know, in this wilderness area. And, and you know, again, there's another photo in here of us kind of shimmying the bikes across the, the little rigging system we set up. And that was, that was what we wanted out of that trip. We said, mm -hmm. cool, it, this is not a, you know, 25 day deal. This is not a, you know, on the right, this is Natchez Trace I just talked about. We did that in four days. That's 470 some miles in four days. We didn't get to see any history. Like it was just head down and just chewing on the handlebars and going as fast as possible. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I'm glad we did it, but I wouldn't do that again because I didn't get to see any of the history. Now there was time constraints we had, everybody had work and you know, family and jobs and da da da. So, but that's just another, another factor to be thinking about as you're kind of saying, all right, well, what, what do I want this? What do I want this trip to be about? That was a pretty, pretty straightforward one. Yeah, okay. Anything, anything no. there? You good? Um, real quick on this. Again, this is an intro clinic. I don't expect people to say, all right, I'm going to go, you know, do the Tour de France, you know, route tomorrow. Um, but it's just, I, I've done, an, I've realized it's only been one international one, but it was just amazing. We did a trip to Cuba and it was just amazing to see new culture, new people, new food, new music, new everything that is, you know, again, I've done the Palmetto Trail a few times here in our backyard. Love that too, but it was just a totally different experience. And so mm -hmm. um, just more logistics to think about. You don't have connectivity. You don't speak the same language. Um, I don't know if you've done any international things at all, mm -hmm. but it's just, 
uh, you know, that one's probably, this one's probably driven a little bit more of my, you know, my personal saying, hey, cool, I think it's fun to think about it. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's another one to kind of think about. All right, what do we got next? Gear needs. Oh boy. <laughs> oh God. So again, speaking of Sagwagon, um, and I, I didn't, th this is funny, but that's obviously Recovers Van. They're the, the sponsor of this series, but this is when we did the Blue Ridge Parkway. Same thing, we had a Sagwagon, which really helped it out. So I thought that was kind of a fun, you know, gear explosion shot uh, to, to show you on this one. Next one, I'll kind of shift a little bit more to Samuel on some of this stuff, um, because again, Captain Ultralight knows a whole lot more than, than I do about, uh, about some gear. While he's kind of reading, reading some of my cue notes here, I'll give you a little context. Top left is, um, uh, and again, you can't see it super well, but that's literally everything I took to Cuba for eight days. You know, the passport, I took bananas for some reason. I didn't feel like, I don't know why I thought bananas would be a good move to take. Uh, but anyway, and we stayed at what's called Casa Particulars. They were basically their version of Airbnb. So we knew we were gonna stay, so we weren't gonna do the camping thing, but just a, uh, an amazing experience change of clothes and you know whatever I needed it's kind of a similar thing to the Florida Keys on the right um, bottom left is this is the trip to Pennsylvania uh, last month or two months ago I've also I've kind of recreated that over there on that table if you guys want to check that out later uh, that was a setup for camping I had to transition into the hotels because of the hurricane but you know I needed to be self-reliant so that was kind of the plan there so we can do a Q&A or talk about that, go into detail later if you want. But anyway, gear needs. Gear. All right, this is like see, its yeah, own. See if we can, see if we can kind big. of give some, some basic stuff. Here. Yeah, this is big. Tough. Um, I mean, I think that statement, what you need versus what you want, is probably the core of it. Yeah. Um, because it's, it, it really comes down to that. Um, for me, mm -hmm. most of my trips and most of my experience has been sort of like, okay, how much less can I take each trip? Yeah. sort of thing like I have an ultralight well yeah it's like you you carry what you fear in a lot of ways so carry extra clothes you mm -hmm. carry three you know tubes instead of two tubes mm -hmm. um, and then as each sort of subsequent trip happens you learn the lessons you see what you use you see what you leave behind and I think that's just starts that mental sort of subtraction of yeah I don't need the second pair of gloves turns out I didn't, you know, use the fourth pair of underwear. Yeah. I'll leave that back. Um, so if from like it, it, my one piece of advice would just be don't really worry about it the first time because it's all going to change the second time. Um, so have some considerations about obviously what you're carrying and, and you don't want to carry all of it, but um, just go because that's going to be the, the biggest lesson yeah. versus yeah trying to get super nitty gritty yeah. in the in that first initial trip um, but yeah the priorities prioritizing multi-faceted you know gear mm -hmm. is is super valuable especially when it comes to safety and you know your mechanical um, kit because we're riding mechanical devices and especially for more backcountry travel you are self-reliant um, therefore you need to be able to fix yeah. your 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 gear to get you out of that back, back the backcountry so just thinking, you know, I think most most bike riders to a certain extent already carry a certain level of, of kit to get them out of a situation. And I think with, with bike packing, that kit just gets a little bit bigger mm -hmm. and gets padded with a few extra items that you wouldn't carry on your yeah. typical, you know, yeah. team ride. So um, that's typically where my mind goes is, is more the safety component. Um, first aid, what's your basic first mm -hmm. aid kit that you want to bring. Yeah. Um, but yeah, really, what's the trip? Are you staying in a hotel? Do you need the sleeping kit? Yeah. If you don't, great. That's a lot of weight that you don't have to carry. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just take it. You'll find out what you don't need. And then that's the fun part too. Mm -hmm. It's like, what? <laughs> ah, I what yeah, brought like, that. Well, ah. yeah, it's like thinking when at 10 o'clock at night, oh, where's my headlamp? It's, yeah. it's nowhere here. Um, and then like <laughs> you just men make that mental list, adding, subtracting. Yeah. What do I love? What do I hate? You know, what works well on a bike that doesn't work well in backpacking yeah, yeah. and vice versa? Yeah. Um, because there's there's a lot of crossover, but there's like a surprisingly large amount of non crossovers that you yeah. think yeah. would translate well to the bike. Well, and that's um, kind of why I grabbed these. Right. So yeah. th this is this is just two different um, two different shoes. 
right? And so if you look on the bottom, there's two different cleat systems, right? So on this side here, this is obviously a, this is a recessed cleat. So this is what I take when I'm bike packing. I have, you know, big feet, so I can't like, shoes take up an incredible amount of space. I usually take just a, a super thin sandal, kind of like the old Navy dollar sandals, and then these. And if I need to walk or do whatever, I'm using these. I'm not walking around in my, you know, my road shoes, because I've got this, you know, you've all seen it where you're clicking around. Like if we were walking on this floor right here, you'd, we'd be clicking around. This recessed cleat or this SPD pedal is way more efficient to use as a multifunctional tool. So I don't need to take up space packing an extra pair of shoes on my bike. These are my shoes. Now I have a sandal if I want to do around camp or whatever, but that's mm -hmm. just one example of saying, okay, can I use this item for multiple things? Maybe they're flat pedals. That's totally fine. You're wearing regular sneakers. That's what they, again, whatever you want it to be. But just think about it like, I probably can't pack multiple shoes. Yeah. Or I probably can't pack, you know, multiple underwear, I mean, whatever it is, right? Um, so that's just one example. I wanted to show you guys that, just so you can kind of see some of the differences. Um, and I just, you know, so right now my pedals on, on that gray bike are road pedals. Uh, when I bike pack on it, I switch those pedals out to what's on my mountain bike, the SPD pedal, and wear these shoes. So just another thing to kind of think about to reduce weight, space, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Again, we could probably go into, we're trying to keep this moving here, but we could probably go into a whole nother topic of discussion or yeah. a whole nother se session I, just I for that. Yeah. Samuel mentioned a couple individual kits, like maybe that's a good, like, like a like the sleep kit, like, like the cooking kit. Like, yeah, like you mentioned, yeah. Like yeah. a safety kit. Like, yeah, and a yeah. Maintenance kit. And like, yeah, like, yeah. What are like yeah. the because I think we're all intelligent enough to understand what the words mean. But like, yeah. what yeah. are like the basic? Yeah, like, yeah. So, yeah. so a sleep yeah. kit, like oh, like you don't. Yeah. Care. Like, do I yeah. sleep in? Yeah. Good I'm question. Wearing. No, that's Whatever a great question. Whatever you want, baby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Depends how many beers we're drinking. No, because I no, think beer is not good. Bourbon is the preferred. Uh, yeah, it's like yeah. it packs a punch. Yeah, way, uh, yeah, way, way less yes, weight. Alcohol content to uh, yeah. ratio. No, I would say clothes is one of those yeah. pieces of kit that is <clears throat> highly dependent on you and the trip you're going on. Yeah, exactly. Um, because as we all know, riding in the cold is awful if you don't have the right weather. Um, as is riding in the rain if you're just soaked <laughs> for days. Yeah. Um, so that's going to be super personal to you as, as and the trip you're going on. Um, I obviously try to be as minimal as possible with my clothing because that's also a, a fairly bulky item when you just think about volume and what you're packing. Um, so like you're saying, what do you wear off the bike? Um, for me, that's often like a t-shirt and some shorts, like running shorts. So I also fall like an Adam's camp. Like I am not like two Snickers bars. And a sure. Water, yeah. They're not going to carry me back to my car. No doubt. <laughs> no, and I think, you know, it, it also depends on like, are you wearing bibs and a jersey or are mm -hmm. you in more, you know, baggies and a t shirt and yeah. or just like a, a mountain biking jersey? Um, so I, I think there's ways to, to complement yourself there that's, you know, not so reductive that, you know, you're pulling out a, a you know, a white tee at the end of the day and, and that's all you have. Um, so I think another one too is like, <clears throat> we all know it, right? Gear is this whole other thing where it's like, hey, you can get a pair of cotton socks and then you can get like the most high tech, fancy, mm -hmm. super quick dry da 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 sock. And so with gear, it's kind of the same thing. It's like, start with whatever you have. Again, fill your backpack up with whatever and say, cool, how was that going? Okay, cool. So if I could get, you know, this puffy that packs down into this size, versus the other jacket I was gonna take that packs down into this size, you know, eventually if you start getting into it, those things are gonna start mattering. Yeah. And that's kind of what you're saying. It's like, yeah, I like to say, all right, here's what I have, but what, what can I kind of start slicing off? Yeah, because a functional clothing system is multifunctional. Right. To a certain extent, mm -hmm. where your rain shell now becomes a source of warmth For, uh, when it's cold. Yep. So maybe you don't have to carry that extra fleece or puffy um, as same with, you know, a jersey. Yeah. Um, what do you have? Like maybe just a long sleeve wind shirt that again can be a source of warmth or a wind yep. cut. Um, so there are ways to, to layer that to where yeah. you can make them multifunctional. But I, I will say for like just the, the safety, you know, gear side of things, um, 
you know, some of the extra pieces that I carry for bike packing um, is like chain lube, you know, something you wouldn't necessarily carry on a, a weekend ride, but come morning when you're your yep. gear system sounds like it's you know a dying chicken like it's nice to yeah. have a little rag and yep. even if it's a sock just clean yep. your chain oil it back up that yep. really i think improves your morale and i um, did i wrote a recent journal about what is bike packing and how do i start and we'll see, i put another qr code up here you guys can look at it but <clears throat> in that i also created i think there's four different itineraries of like packing list for four different itineraries some of the and then i was mixing in in um mixing up well, this is a two day, you know, camping, and this is a three day hotel, hmm. and this is a five day whatever. And so I printed out a bunch of those. If you guys want to take some, again, you can find them online under the journal, but printed out some of those just itinerary <clears throat> or sample itineraries with the suggested packing list. So some of that stuff's in there like, what do, what do I need? Well, if you're not camping, then no, you don't need some of that stuff. Yeah. And on that is chain lube and some of that stuff that you're talking about. Yeah, um, like a because those derailleur are, hanger. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so as far as like first aid and stuff, that was kind of another one. I have asthma, so I don't go anywhere without my inhaler. Um, um, I actually have started doing like the whole CBD thing that helps me sleep, and so I started doing that. Um, that's going to be a personal thing, right? It's like the first aid kit I took to Pennsylvania was super basic. I took, um, you know, basic, you know, some some band aids some really small kind of like um, uh, medical tape. Um, I always take duct tape with me. In fact, I think there's like a little thing up here. Yeah, but um, um, duct tape is a, is a money maker. Also, peanut butter fits Ooh. perfectly into a bike cage, if you guys didn't know that. Yeah, yeah but uh, I just wrapped duct tape around that. But anyway, that's another perfect, that's kind of a packing thing. Um, yeah. But um, first day kit is super basic. In that, I had um, some um, like uh, like it's called it's like a shower wipe. So if you're camping, right, just kind of just clean off the sweat and stuff like that. So I didn't go super wild with it. I my plan with that was if shit really hit the fan, then the first aid kit ain't gonna cut it anyway. So I didn't want to waste you know centimeters and, and you know grams on packing that and taking it 700 miles. That was kind of a oh, hit the oh shit button and then figure that out. Um, I'm not recommending that, uh, but that is, I mean, that's a good question. Like, all right, well, how much is too much? And you knew for that trip that you were going to be town, you were going to go through a lot of towns. There, there, a I, lot of CBSs. I, I was in, to, yeah. well, I was going to be in the parkway, which I came off that because the services were closed, but so it ended up being that. But um, <clears throat> I, I, I felt over the years of doing this, I felt comfortable with where I was within my own self-emergency you know response for lack of a better term yeah what's that probably not a bad idea yeah so and actually so here so talk about multifunction. you can see and i've we've we'll given some of these out today from were some giveaways but these these kind of ratchet straps or not ratchet straps, these tension straps here the orange straps on my the seat bag there those can those work that's how i strap my sandals to my to my pack that's how on the bottom you can see my the the tools are on the bottom of that uh the green sierra nevada bottle those are all my tools so that tension strap around that could easily double as a as a tourniquet yeah so that's again that's another multi-use thing and i had a the whole system was various lengths so if it was you know an arm or a leg or whatever i had various length straps with me throughout that thing if i needed that there's an emergency blanket in there that i took Mm -hmm. um that's kind of one of those you know that's it's a, maybe the size of a deck of cards and weighs a couple ounces grams even so like that's something i always kind of throw in but yeah. kind of again it kind of depends on where your comfort level is yeah talk more about the pros and cons advantages of uh, different sleep systems is that like i'm on the cusp right right now yeah i started off bike touring Yep. Mm -hmm. um, I realized with bike packing, I need to have a light and load. Yeah. Um, my two person backpack and tent, I don't know what it weighs, but it's like several pounds. Yeah. yeah. It's significant. Um, yeah. So the last bike packing trip I did, I brought, I just bought a tarp off Amazon, mm -hmm. you know, that's got the, the cords, the guidelines yep. yeah. that attach to the pilots. And 
felt like a kid again making up all the words. Yeah, yeah. hell yeah. I'll try the A-frame tonight, and tomorrow night I'll try the lean-to style. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, see, where, see what happens then. Endless happens possibilities. Then. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, luckily, I didn't have, you know, rain either night. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. I'll let you take this one. Here, like, what's, yeah. I saw the picture, and I've seen that before, too, where you need, like, a, a stick or something to... Uh, yeah, the so the, the center pole. Yeah, the old, yeah. he's yep. got that over there. Um, again, it's, it, there's pros and cons, and I, I typically revert to what is the trip, and speed, I think, is a, a big indicator for me of, of what I hope to get out of the trip. Uh -huh. Fast and light, obviously, comes with its disadvantages, and, you know, longer, uh, you maybe allow yourself a few more luxuries than you mm -hmm. would if yep. you were trying to get, move quickly. Um, I've, I've used flat tarps before, um, not necessarily in bike packing, but in, in backpacking. Um, and I, I like those. Um, I think they need to be paired with appropriate, you know, ground sheets mm -hmm. and sometimes a bivy if you're running into bug pressure or, you know, anything that you, you know, some, some weather related. Yeah. Um, so then you start getting into the realm of, okay, is the five, six ounces saved worth the freestanding tent mm -hmm. situation, which gives you more room and, and, and then it just becomes, yeah, and then it just becomes a, a never ending battle. <laughs> yeah. And this, um, and the photo you saw, right, that was the, yeah, that was the, was that the two person? That was the two person, two just, person the, just shell. the shell yeah. with a bivy. Yeah. 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 So that worked well for me. Um, and you can put, you kind of can put the bike underneath. Yeah, there, I could so put you... the bike underneath as well. Um, Cause on the divide, you know, it's, it's pretty diverse as far as weather systems and you're getting after in storms and there's hail, there's a lot of snow last year. Mm -hmm. um, so typically I look at the forecast as best as you can for, for these trips um, and sort of just make a judgment call. Um, but yeah, in this day and age, like the ultralight tents are, are very compact, very light, um, and offer really incredible space as far as just livable, you know, bubbles. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, with a, a very obviously weatherproof, you know, yeah, ground like sheet like included. Tour, yeah. yeah, so it's it's getting pretty close to a toss up as far as you know, tarping with a bivy versus you know a, a single person, two person ultralight, fully you know freestanding. Um, so then it comes down to preference of, again, how comfortable are you in the tarp with a bivy, making your selection of, of your campsite, mm -hmm. because that's a big deal when it, you know, if it rains. Yeah. Where are you sleeping? Are you in a, a yeah. low spot? You need to be mindful of that versus more of a traditional freestanding tent. You can just, mm -hmm. whoosh, yeah. you know, it's up in a minute and a half and you're you know, inside eating dinner. Yeah. Um, so that's, I mean, it's a very, personal and I think it's really too like trying both and seeing what you like and I think if you can master both then you have both of those in your quiver and so for a fast and light trip you you're you know golden with your 10 ounce tarp and you're out on the road yeah and if it looks bad or, or bug pressure is really awful you have the freestanding tent that you know uh, but as far as other kit you know I know people who don't bring a sleeping bag and they just wear a puffy mm -hmm. and some warmer pants and that's pretty hardcore. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know that I would do that. Again, it's, it's, that's the trip they wanted. They're sleeping mm -hmm. five hours a night and they're, you know, they're riding their bike 19 yeah. hours a day. Um, God bless them. He said, uh, he's going to do the tour divide again this year. <laughs> he's going to race it this so, year. So. Yeah, I would say, I mean, again, that's the fun part to me is like, there's endless possibilities when it comes to gear, when it comes to how you build your trip. Um, and I just like trying things, mm -hmm. you know? Um, that system obviously worked well, so I know that I have that option for future trips. But yeah, I, I, I would like to, you know, take a flat tarp on the biking and um, maybe not bring any poles, but use the bike as the center post and mm -hmm. have that be the, you know, yeah. you can get kind of weird with it. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, some people are like, hey, I have to get good sleep at the end of the day. And like that's, that is a true, that yeah. is a critical thing for them. And if they're out on a multi, you know, three, four, five, you know, if they're not getting that good quality sleep then that's going to just ruin their trip. So they may need to pack a nice some, pad. Yeah, something that's going to give them that comfort. 
other people are like, I don't care. I could go sleep on the side of a, a road in a ditch and I'm good. Yeah. Well, then they don't have to like, you know, they don't have to do anything. The other thing too is I, I've actually converted quite a bit from, I used to be a big hammock guy. Mm. And again, that's, you know, Florida Keys, we did that, but we knew we had, you know, trees to be able to, to strap up to, but I've, I've really transitioned way more into the tent. So I used to be very heavy. I would just take that hammock everywhere and I was good to go. Now I just, for, man, I'm getting old or whatever, but don't sleep nearly as well in a hammock. And so I, I have to go with the tent. And for, for me, again, very, I think it's maybe the same exact one that was in that photo when it's on that table there, but the Hyperlight Mountain Gear, it's, it's, it's a two-person tent. I like it. It's probably more, obviously I don't need a two-person tent for me, but I like it because it gives me a chance to like set up and then I can kind of do my gear audit each night. And also in the morning, it's just an easier, quicker, more efficient process. If I have a little extra space in my shelter mm. that I can kind of, you know, if I need to lay stuff out, if I need to do whatever, it gives me some more wiggle room to kind of have that convenience that I personally find is cool. That just kind of helps me on this, you know, long, arduous kind of trip. Those are kind of some of the things that help me. That may be totally different for someone no, else. I agree, yeah. I think yeah. that's, you can't un like overstate that as, yeah. What it like? What's your comfort level of one comfort yeah. sleep? Yeah. I need a nice pad. I need you know a little warmer sleeping bag yeah. because it's you know. Yeah. Um, but then also, I mean, I think a lot of people who may not have spent a lot of time in the backcountry have some fears around spending time. Like if it's a solo trip, mm -hmm. you know, and having a nice double walled tent yeah psychologically <laughs> is a great way to like okay yeah there's nothing out there i get yeah. to sleep there's no cows um, are going to attack me yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, I am someone who like i need to sleep well to function yeah um so that i i typically you know carry a warmer bag mm -hmm. because i don't want to be cold yeah so I, I do carry a bit more weight in yeah. that sort of sector just because that's yeah. important as part of your gear no? i do yeah. typically uh, one of those, you know, thermo rests, pretty light, yeah. blow up. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, it, the thing. With all of this, it's it's very subjective to what works for you. Yeah. All right, everybody, we're going to take a quick break from our session. Hopefully, you've learned a thing or two so far. But um, we are here at Recover HQ with Recover founder and president Bill Johnson. Um, Want to throw a quick thanks to them for supporting. Uh, Rec 101 and also being able to bring this to you on YouTube. So Bill, thank you for for supporting this and for, for doing what you're doing. Tell them a little bit about yeah. Recover if you don't mind. Well, yeah, th uh, thanks for putting it on. Uh, we hope everybody's enjoying the programming. Uh, a big reason why we want to support things like this is because we're a mission-driven company. Mm -hmm. um, we've always aimed to, to educate and inspire people to be better stewards of the environment. I feel like one of the best ways to do that is to get outside and oh, experience yeah. the outdoors yourself. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, we hope everybody's enjoying it and, and finding a reason to, to continue to protect this place we all call home. Well, that's exactly right. And let's get back to the action. We've got to figure out how we can get outside and get active and, uh, and just enjoy life a little bit more. So stay tuned. Got done for, for Samuel, just a quick thank you. This was the on the tour divide. So anyway, I thought that was kind of a cool picture to use for, for packing tips. So um, all right. well, now that our, now that our guy left, um, all right. Quick packing tips again, no exact rhyme or reason, or you know, it's not like, hey, this is 100% the way you need to do it, find what works for you, but here are some tips. Let the bike do the heavy lifting for you, right? Like, and if you're on a long, like let's say you're on a you know, two day thing or whatever it is, you're, you're riding forever, you don't want that weight on your shoulders or on your back or whatever it is, let the bike do the heavy lifting. For example, if you look at my bike back here, the bottom kind of third of that triangle bag, that frame bag, I've used that for a couple different things. Sometimes um, that's where I'll put my, my water bladder and I'll run a, a hose up to the, you know, to the handlebars. That water, right, that's, that's a lot of weight, that's a lot of volume, mm -hmm. that sits low on the bike, that sits in the middle of the bike, it's not swaying behind me on my seat bag. It's not out here on my handlebars where I need to have more effort to kind of keep control of it. Um, the problem is that, you know, if you're doing two liters of water, it weighs a lot. So I've had to do that on some trips where we knew we couldn't resupply water very quickly. So I knew I needed to have a, uh, a reserve. Um, 
for Pennsylvania, I didn't do my hydration there, but that was where I had all my food. I packed all my food in there um, as I knew I needed to be, especially with the hurricane coming through, I knew it needed to be self-sufficient. If I needed to hole up in the tent for a few days and I need to have enough food, then I had everything there. That was again, a real dense, you know, cluster of, of things there. So, you know, definitely let the, let the bike do the heavy lifting. It is amazing if you have an extra few pounds on the mm -hmm. handlebars, what each turn, that'll wear you out over the course of the day for sure. Same thing on the back. If you're swaying in the back, that, that's, that stuff will start to wear on you. Mm -hmm. um, same idea, keep the majority of the weight centered. Um, so talking about like sleep systems and like, you know, cooking systems and all that stuff. And same on those is way better than I do, but like I pack all those together, right? So it's like, hey, if I need to, at the end of the day, I know all my sleeping stuff for me is on my handlebars, right? My, my uh, sleeping bag, my sleeping pad, my pillow, all that stuff is right on the handlebars. My tent goes on either uh, side of the fork and I, I know exactly where it is. Same thing with my cooking system. It all goes in the back. I have everything, I know exactly where it is. It's not this big guessing game at the end of the day. You don't want to be, mm -hmm. where the hell did I put the um, spoon? And all of a sudden now you got the, now you got the yard sale out there and you're, you're doing the damn gear explosion. We've spoon. all done, right? Everyone started laughing. We've all had to do that. That sucks. Then you layer on, it starts raining. You're just like, this is not, you know. So anyway, I like to pack all my stuff in groupings mm -hmm. and, um, and try and keep those easily rememberable for me. That's kind of my, how I've gotten into it. That's my routine that I do now. And so I'm, I'm gonna do another bike packing trip in March for a couple uh, to Williamsburg, Virginia. And I know my process. I know where everything goes. And so it'll be just kind of quick and easy. Um, another thing, what do you need to access mid-ride, right? Mm -hmm. So this is huge, right? If you need to get something and it's in the bottom of your frame bag or in your seat bag or handlebar bag and you can't access it, then that's, that's just not efficient. So. Mm -hmm. Again, on my bike, I've got, you know, there's a feed bag up front. Again, the kind of the gas tank, that's where I keep my um, quick snacks, you know, just quick snacks. If I know I need to eat something while I'm riding, but I don't want to spend the time to stop, all that stuff's going right on front. Phone obviously goes up there. Um, I do uh, like credit card cash, all that stuff right up top. So if I get off, I'm at the convenience store. It's just a quick, I don't mm -hmm. have to dig through all my crap. I'm just say, hey, cool, credit card's here going in, coming back out, and I can keep rolling. So, um, and I'll, you know, Sam, I would, I would love for you to share some of this stuff too, but let me just finish these last two up. How frequently do you need to access the various items? Again, same thing, sleep system, right? It's once a day, clearly. Yeah, you don't need to be digging around there multiple times. So that can be at a hard to reach area, you know, uh, um, that you don't, you know, you mm -hmm. don't need to get to it. What's most fragile and important, so again, you know, you've ridden a lot with, you know, camera gear and all this kind of stuff. So there's, you know, there's a lot of different things that are very important to like, hey, I don't care if, you know, a ratchet, you know, a, a strap falls off or whatever, but I do care if my phone breaks or if I, you know, something that I need, need gets damaged. If, let's say I happen to crash and all of a sudden, you know, my something very important to me gets caught up in that. Well, that's not ideal. So same thing on that. I like to pack my fragile and, and important stuff. I like mm -hmm. to pack it in my, in my frame bag. It's more protected. It's kind of like a, you know, the, the bike frame itself is like ribs, right? It kind of protects everything in there. It's kind of protects your vital organs. So that's kind of my quick, quick rundown. I, obviously I think it's good to share kind of some of your stuff, what you've seen over the years as well. Yeah, I would say it's, it's fairly similar. Um, my, yeah, my mind goes to where's my food, right? What can I ask? Yeah, as most, as most, yeah. most humans do, um, yeah. But really, I think with food, like what can I access while I'm moving? Mm -hmm. um, like a quick, you know, Snickers bar, Pop Tart, what have you, a waffle. <laughs> um, and then like, what's the s secondary snacks? For me, I typically kept a lot of snacks on, you know, the, the, the gas tank and or the, um, what do you call those? The, the feed bag. Yeah, like a mm -hmm. feed bag. Fits a can of Pringles really well. Oh, on the forks? Yeah. Um, and then like the top of my frame bag, I kept a lot of secondary food. Mm -hmm. So that was sort of like the day's food, if you will, mm -hmm. that didn't like lunch. Yeah, time. that like didn't yeah. fit all in the, in the top bags. Um, and then like my dinners and stuff, like, you know, the ramen noodles, um, <laughs> that would be, yeah, 
That would be in the, the, in the tail bag, mm -hmm. just because I didn't need that until yeah. you know, dinner yeah. time. Um, but very similar, I kept all of my, uh, and I've sort of iterated on this a little bit. I'm still thinking through ways to change it, but on the divide at least, you can sort of see the photo here. Um, yeah, my sleep kit was in the front of, you know, the handlebars similar to what Adam has. Um, my frame bag was a mixture of food. It was a mixture of some weather gear. Like I kept my, you know, rain shell in there. Um, I had a lot of my, yeah, pull this forward. I was going to say, that one's like behind most of the bike? Yeah. yeah. yeah we'll pull it show this. Because um, this is basically what I, I mean, very similar. Yeah, this should be pretty similar to the divide. Yeah. I would say the only thing that I had in addition to this is I had a, um, I don't know what you would call it, like a re another top two bag that mm. I kept a lot of my yep. mechanical stuff mm -hmm. in. Um, but yeah, phone, credit card, all of the snacks. I think I had two, um, I think you did two feed yeah. bags. I would keep a can of Coke in one and yeah. um, a lot of, it was also my trash receptor, mm -hmm. just a quick out of the way. Um, and then yeah, sleep kit up here, which worked pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, I don't love having stuff on the handlebar, but it, sometimes it's hard to get around. Chris, go back one. Yeah, get there, around, you know. His, there you can see right there. Yeah. And then I did end up having my shelter on one side of the fork with water bottles, and I kept some extra tubes on the other side of the fork as a just in case, you know. <laughs> oh, shit. How, how's the suit so, uh, yeah. What? That's, that's in a, oh, this is I all see. in a dry bag. Gotcha. Yep, this is kind of like what, a, just, um, a, just a holder. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's like a burrito it's holder. The, yep. Yeah, this attaches the handlebars. This is just basically a shell. Yeah. It holds it. Yeah. It's like and a dry I'd, bag. Yeah, I'd put all that in a dry bag and touch it down. Yep. I think I had the salsa anything or everything yeah. cage on, yeah. on mine, which is a very similar setup. Um, one thing too, and I don't, I don't want to change topics here because I think this is good, but like, no. so this is a trick that Captain Ultralight over here uh, came up with, but these are, these are basically the exact same thing, right? So when we think about packing and space and even pliability, like, all right, I need to get this down into here. Just dump these in. This needs to be a freezer bag, right? So you can literally boil, you know, boil the water and dump it into here. But this is so much easier to pack. It's mm -hmm. compact. That the was, other, that what's that? That wasn't designed to sell. That was designed to sell. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. Yeah, but, <laughs> but now the other thing is too, Easier to pack out, 100%. Less trash, right? Yeah, 100%. What I do too, and you can kind of see I rode on here. It doesn't really matter. Like at that stage, you're like, I don't care what I'm eating. I just need calories. I just take a picture of, you know, all right, how much water, how much time do I need? I just take a picture and I always have it. That way I don't need any of this stuff. I can get rid of it at home. <laughs> this is way, way, way easier. Again, keep, again, this has to be a, a, a freezer. freezer bag though. Yeah. Yeah. And what we do, and we did this all day long in Alaska, but we just, you know, boil the water, dump the water in, and just put it straight back in the jet boil. And you're just using the jet boil as your bowl. Right. Yeah. So it's way easier to clean up than two. Yeah. And again, those are, you know, just toss those out too, but this is just such an easier. And if you need to like change this up in order to get it into a spot, you know, if you need to change the size or shape mm -hmm. of this, this is way easier than, you know, what you buy straight out of off the shelf. Yeah. So. Again, there's a couple little tricks in that too. And you know, that goes with, you know, gears getting smaller and more technical and all lighter and all this kind of stuff. Well, you know, there's easy fixes to do the, you know, some of this stuff too. Yeah, the, yeah it's funny. You're like yeah, all this technical changer. stuff. And like the one takeaway was, oh, I got to get a couple of freezer <laughs> yeah. bags. And it becomes a good trash bag too. Yeah. yeah. Like I've used them just to, instead of having a million wrappers floating around yeah. your bags. Um, this is, it depends on where you're going and stuff, but um, a smell proof bag is also kind of something to think yeah. about too. Um, I was Alaska, we, we had bear cans and, and all that stuff, but that's just another thing. And again, depending on where you're going, what you're doing, all that kind of stuff. But if you have, you know, if you're eating out of this, you probably don't want this to be sitting next to your sleeping bag in your tent. Yeah. If you're out in, you know, some, in some deep wilderness or some bear country, that'd be a, be a bad way to wake up in the middle of the night. Yeah. Often what I did is I carried my stove 
as close to the seat That's exactly, stay as I could. That's exactly what I did too. Um, and then obviously within mm -hmm. the stove was the, you know, the fuel and the, the lighter apparatus. Mm -hmm. um, and then what else did I carry back here? A lot of clothes, uh, mm -hmm. like some warmth, I would say. Like I think my, my puffy was back here. That's what I did. Um, my food for dinner and or any other food that I couldn't stuff into the top of this bag. Um, Nothing that you would need during the ride. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, if I had to open yeah. up this, it was, it was typically a bad day. Um, <laughs> just because it's, you know, it's, it's annoying. It's a, yeah, it's annoying. Um, and it's really not that annoying, but it's like when you want to ride a bike, it's annoying. The, um, some other things I've put in there. So Pennsylvania, I had the, that center pole for the, for the mm. sleep system. I had that in there because it kind of fit in nicely. See, I always, I always carried that mm -hmm. here. That's a good spot for it too. Like right down the... What's that? It, yeah, no, we have it it's, it's, a, table there. it's can, a four piece break. Yeah. yeah, feel free to go over there. Um, the other one I did when we went to um, Cuba, and again, this all depends on where you're going and what you're doing, but Cuba, there was no, we couldn't get other bike parts at all, right? There's just, they're driving around 1950s cars because they can't get new stuff. And so we were very intentional about saying, all right, well, if we're doing this for nine days and whatever miles, we need to make sure we're taking some stuff that we mm -hmm. know. So I had, um, I had some spokes, extra spokes along this. That was one of the few places I could put them. Um, as well as there was another thing I had that was kind of a long linear thing. The seat bag is a good option for that. Um, again, the, the frame bag is a good one too, but like there's some, some things, there's only so many places you can put them. And yeah. so um, that was just another, you know, that was relevant to that ride or that trip, uh, but mm -hmm. that worked out really well. And on that one, we kind of did a shared packing process. So I kind of had everyone's spokes in mind other people had everyone's this and you know in theirs and so we kind of collectively packed one thing i will say with that is i'm a big fan of hey yeah like cool you've got the stove i've got the whatever the downside is if for whatever reason something happens to you know he's got one stove for the group for a week well if that stove somehow he crashes you know whatever it is now get no one has a stove so just it's that's another thing to kind of think about is all right shared packing is is a great idea for efficiency mm -hmm. um but just make sure you're kind of thinking okay well let me think one step ahead of that if that shared packing goes south because our one stove got compromised then we're all kind of you know in trouble yeah i will say you can fit a lot in the frame bag yeah that's that's impressive it's sort of the much. gift that keeps on giving honestly there's compartments um, inside and stuff too so you can kind of Kind yeah. of quarantine awesome stuff um this is another one too we talked a little about this the hip pack um this obviously goes around the waist kind of like this so right here um this is i've used this on the palmetto trail again this is more of a mountain bike thing a um, you carry some more of that weight on your lower back which isn't ideal so what i i did with that is i tried to pack the lightest stuff in here mm -hmm. so the heavy stuff as we talked about before was on the bike but the lighter stuff was on here um, this was also something that I could quickly access. Um, if it was like a quick, you know, hydration flask or something like that, you can, mm -hmm. there's some compartments here. Also on this side, you can see there's literally hip pockets. So again, for me, you know, if that's my inhaler or, you know, something that I could maybe, actually looks like there's chapstick, that's a good one. <laughs> um, so stuff like that, that's another good option. Again, if you don't have as much space on your bike, you can kind of go with the hip pack. Um, that also is a, you know, this also can be a hydration. Mm -hmm. There's a bladder in here. Um, so you can run a hydration through this as well if you want. Kind of depends on what you want to do. So I have actually a rear rack. Um, my, are, you, are, you talking about, are you talking about panniers? Like on the yeah. sides? Yeah. Um, so my bike is currently a million pieces in my my living room, um, so I didn't bring it today. <laughs> the um, gear explosion. But yeah, so basically my iteration from this setup is uh, a carbon fiber rear rack that is, is quite similar to the more traditional um, touring sort of setup where you have the panniers on the side. Um, mine has the option to add or remove the panniers, um, and I'm butchering that. Um, Roll with it, baby. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's by the company Tailfin. I don't know if you've heard of them, but they uh, 
are newer out of uh, the UK. Um, and it's, it sort of incorporates the pros of bike packing versus the cons of sort of the, the heavier, you know, steel or, or um, aluminum uh, rack systems that are traditional in, in touring. Um, so that's, I would say, gaining popularity versus the traditional just seat bag. Because what you run in with these, uh, depending on how it's packed and how much weight you have behind the seat, you can get some sway, mm -hmm. um, which Especially is actually, out of the saddle, for sure. yeah, like if you stand up, up a hill and you're throwing the bike a little side to side, if you have a lot of weight back there, it's actually fairly mm -hmm. noticeable how much that can impact your, your stride. Yeah. Um, whereas having, I think, a rack is, is much more sturdy, much more, you know, fixed. Um, and I have, I have a lot of friends actually up in Asheville who have front racks and they, you know, mm -hmm. run those on with great success. Yep. So I don't think there's a wrong answer. Um, this has sort of become, I think, the, the go-to because it's, it's easy. A lot of people sell that gear, you know, you can strap something to the, the top handlebars fairly easily. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's a classic for a reason. So um, as long as there's a weight, you know, you're fine with a weight penalty or, or that sort of yeah, it's, deal. It's um, less aerodynamic, but if that's a variable that you're like, well, I'm not going for speed, then yeah. then it's an irrelevant variable. So. Yeah. It's actually pretty good. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, if it's very technical and you're trying to, you know, put the bike in front of you and get a little bit behind the seat, that can be problematic. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're doing that in a drop bar with a bike packing kit already, like you're, mm -hmm. you know, you're in for a rough time already. Um, I would say though, it's, it's I, I didn't notice it much on the divide. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that the rack is, I've only, I only rode that with that on the, um, uh, the, the Northern Vermont, Vermont yeah. uh, I couldn't think of it, uh, Vermont trip this past year, so. Um, but it, it certainly is much of a lower profile. It basically sits underneath the seat um, and bolts down to the, the back frame, almost by the back axle. Um, so in that case, you're not even, that's not even an issue, essentially. Um, but yeah, I, I've never really noticed it. Yeah. Unless they do. for the worst of terrain, yeah. you know. So I, So they actually, yes, you can, if you have the eyelets, they have adapters, um, quick release, or you can actually run it through your axle. They, they'll sell an mm. axle with the quick release on the, on the yeah. axle there. Mm. So that's actually, you can use it on a mountain bike, which is nice. Yeah. Well, that's um, good because, because it has the actual pivots on it. And that particular bike has a dropper post and- You can use it with a dropper post. Yeah, well, they, they tell you not to do a seat bag on the dropper post. So yeah. if you can't do that, then you're, all right, well, now I don't have that option. So if you, if you can run this through the axle of a mountain bike, then that can maybe open up that option for you as well. That you couldn't get from going on a seat bag on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that because the drop of post can't lift the weight? What's that? Is that because the drop of post can't lift the weight? No, I think, I, and I don't know exactly. No, I think it's because of the dropper the post. will post. Like, yeah, you don't want to damage like, the post. Yeah, it's like the fork where you don't want to scratch the surface of the post itself. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because you're attaching, you can see on the back here, you're attaching this and it tightening out. it down. And, you know, obviously that's got some, some sway oh, in there just, when you're yeah, out. So any level. of that little rubbing can, can potentially damage the post itself. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, cool, well, let's keep moving. We're kind of, you know, I don't want to keep y'all, but um, this, is, this, is some good, this is some good stuff. And again, we'll stick around here for a little bit as well. Um, again, if you guys want, we can send this stuff out too, but if you want to grab any of this stuff, bikepacking.com is top left, Adventure Cycling Association is top right. This is the journal I wrote, uh, what is bikepacking, where do I start? And there is a, so for the Charlotte people, this is, you know, this is not for YouTube, but for Charlotte people, there's, you know, there's local opportunities to do this too. I mean, we may start mm -hmm. doing some of these quick overnighters, but um, Charlotte spokespeople is doing an overnighter at McDowell Nature Preserve, which is kind of down towards the Fort Mill area, but when is that? Uh, March 25th, I believe. Um, so grab that if you want. Uh, I think they're doing like 20 bucks or something like that, but it's same idea, it's this, this. It's like, hey, let's just kind of go out and see what it's like. So there's, 
you know, we're, we're obviously going to put this up on YouTube. So there's people all over the country that are going to check this out. They can, my point is, go check out whatever's in your area. That's one that's mm -hmm. specific to us here in the Charlotte region. So um, real quick, this, this photo is from the um, uh, hurricane route in Florida. Um, you can see on this, you can see right here actually the uh, hydration, right? So here's where I had all my hydration in the lower third and I ran my tube up here. Um, this was a uh, live off the land trip. So no, no, um, no camping gear or anything like that. Um, but we knew we needed to get to the hotels each night. This was also the, uh, the McDonald's and uh, Cracker Barrel photo I think you saw before. So. Cracker Barrel. But there's like, so again, this is another, there was literally water crossings after dark in Gator Country that we were terrified. We we're like, holy shit, don't want to do that, but I got to get to the hotel. And then later we literally rode through a, a active forest fire because that was our only route we could get through. And we literally talked to the firefighters and like, you guys should not be doing this. And we're like, well, we, it was getting, it was actually dark. And we had, we would have had to gone 60 miles backtrack to get around. And we just kind of probably shouldn't sit, but skirted them. And like, you know, we knew we had 20 miles to get to the hotel. So like, again, adaptability on these trips are, are super important. Uh, the other guy I was with blew a spoke and it shot through the sidewall of the, um, of his rear tire. And so he was down two spokes. We had to limp it to a bike shop that uh, didn't have, he, he had I-9, mm -hmm. uh, kind of a very specialized wheel. And so they didn't have spokes. So anyway, got to be, got to be ready for anything. Uh, yeah, any other questions here before? We'll do some more giveaways out of our, of our uh, bike hat. I'll but it's the last yeah, slide. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Sam, so on your, on your big, uh, yeah, so roughly. First for a, the bike and jet bike and hiking experience. I'm just curious, how did you decide what amount of water you wanted to take with you? Yeah. How much was that? And then was that something that you whittled down as you went as well? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I definitely did my research. Uh, the divide is a mixed bag because you run into such diverse like ecosystems. Obviously, the southern ends in you know New Mexico, the desert, so. There's not a lot of water down there, but up north, like there's Montana, Wyoming, you know, Colorado, there's a lot of running streams and rivers. Um, so it's a little bit of, of a guessing game, I would say. I believe my capacity um, maxed out at about five liters. And on average, I probably carried two to three. Um, and that was just due to uh, one, sort of knowing what I can operate on. Um, I typically live life a little dehydrated, so <laughs> I, I'm well Quote prepared. <laughs> um, <laughs> right there, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're taking notes. Um, taking notes. Okay, Samuel said live life. So, okay, got it. <laughs> it was a, you know, there's conversations. You get northbound Ooh. riders, you have the conversation of, hey, how's the, you know, water up there? What's the train? Um, but there's a few known sections that are dry, and those are pretty well established. Uh, the basin being the, the, the greatest of those. Um, so in those sectors, there's a little bit of fear mongering where it's like, oh, you need to carry 10 liters. Um, and if you're moving at, you know, seven miles, like you need to, if you're gonna be out there for a day and a half. But um, if you're also hitting certain speeds, like you can pass through it. Um, and then it's like, is it hot, is it cold? Sure. All those factor in. Um, so I was fairly flexible, but yeah, I, I carried, in the in the basin five liters um and then on average probably two to three and i had a filter with me so i could yeah. you know and yeah there was definitely moments where you know you don't have any water and you're like well i probably should have filled up at that last creek um because now i'm climbing uphill and it looks like there's no water for the next you know at least 20 miles um so you you learn and sometimes you get a little snake bite but mm -hmm. So on this, on the uh, hurricane route against Central Florida, um, we had predetermined where we, we knew we could get water. And one of them was at like a wildlife cleaning station outside of this uh, you know, national forest. And when we got there, we refilled. We, were, we knew we were stretching to get there, so we were super dehydrated. We got there, but the water was super like, I don't know what it was, but it was basically like sulfur water. Mm. And so the, here's a downside of doing the bladder. Guess what flavor I had in my 
splatter for the remainder of the trip. Nice. It was horrible. <laughs> Well, and I will, so there's a downside of <laughs> yeah. And I will say, um, circling back to like the safety gear, um, having two types of filtration. So I obviously carried a filter, a little Sawyer squeeze, um, mm. but then I also carried iodine tablets yeah. that, in case for whatever reason the filter froze, I yeah. I lost it, I left it. Yeah. Um, I had another, you know, redundancy there, and you know, because nobody wants the the, the bad bug. day. It's a bad day. <laughs> Um, I would say any overnighter, yeah, if would, if I'm not like in town, like if it's a fairly backcountry specific, um, but it's so light. I mean, it's three ounces. Small. Yeah, it's there's there's one probably exactly has one. on that table right there. Um, too, and then yeah. if you, if you don't want to carry that, you can carry the tablets, which are mm -hmm. nothing. You know, yeah. I mean, you have to wait a little time to to before you can drink. But um, but yeah, I would say. It's such a small penalty for for a vital resource. Yeah. Um, one other thing too that Samuel, um, when we were on that Linville trip, um, was great. It had two bottles, right? And you would filter. You would start the filter process into the one bottle, and then filter. You always started with one bottle that would get. Well, dirtier. yeah. So that was. I mean, that was something I picked up on the PCT. Was essentially having a clean and a dirty bottle, mm -hmm. and it works a little less great on the bike given the biking mm -hmm. specific bottles that most people carry. Um, Cause hiking, in my opinion, the ideal bottle is a smart water bottle, one liter. Ultra light, it's like a one ounce per bottle. Um, and the thread of the, yeah. um, of the filter threads perfectly onto the bottle itself. So you can use it like a straw or just, you know, like he was saying, have it a designated dirty bottle to so fill and then filter into a designated clean bottle, mm -hmm. essentially. So I did that on, on the divide as well, because um, I had access to um, keeping a, a smart water bottle on my cage. Um, yeah. But a lot, you know, the bags that they send with the Sawyers are okay. They typically fall apart after yeah. a little while. Yeah. Um, but there's a million different bags you can you can use that are you know yeah. pretty easy any other questions i've got my goodies ready here it's ready anxiously waiting yeah 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 so essentially with hyperlight they like to build their products into a modular basis um, so what you have here is the the actual tarp so this is the exterior frame of it. Correct. So this is a pyramid, um, and you stake out the four corners, run the you know the the stand right up in the middle, and it's a perfect standalone shelter. Yeah. And what you're holding here is essentially their netting with a bathtub floor option. So that's able to be inserted inside this tarp, and it acts like a, a two wall shelter. Um, where you have a big bathtub floor, but you also have, you know, really nice, you know, bug netting. So um, correct. So that's like totally enclosed. Mm -hmm. They also have another option where it's purely the bug netting. Mm -hmm. So you can just go without a, a, you know, bathtub floor and either bring your own, you know, ground sheet or just go sans ground sheet. Um, and it sort of just comes down to what's your weight sort of appetite because, you, you know, um, I, I didn't, do you have a bivy? I didn't bring mine. I didn't. No, I didn't. Um, but t I mean, the, the size factor of a bivy is, uh, is very minimal. Very minimal. Yeah, yeah. snap around the uh, sleeping bag. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there's different types of bivvies. Some are, um, you know, literally just a, a small enclosure that, you know, you just sort of slide into. Slide into um, and then there's other bivvies that actually have very short, um, you know, t uh, tent-like structures uh -huh. that basically just get the fabric off of your face and give like you a, a coffin, essentially. Yeah. So there's there's options there as well. Um, but you yeah you can get pretty like four ounces like very very compact. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. I mean, I will say a bivy is uh, not a place you want to spend a lot of your free time. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's like it. functional. I'm, I'm going to eat but... dinner and then I'm going to slide into this thing and <laughs> crawl out of it in five hours. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. You're not. Whereas yeah. the, the, the two person tent, like yeah. I've had three people in there before sleeping in like perfect room, you get mm -hmm. a bunch of headroom. So again, it's, it's that pro con of like, yeah. yeah, how much time are you spending in your tent? Yeah. Are you eating dinner in your tent? Um, yeah. Cool, what else we got? So yeah. Do you have a good trailer example of something that would be backcountry all dirt? You mentioned Palmetto Trail, but I think you said that was like 65% runaway. Yeah, so. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Good, like wilderness, backcountry, all dirt Like local right? around here? 200 mile radius. I mean, Pisgah is just loaded with options, right? You can yeah. stitch work kind of anything together there. The um, fun thing is bikepacking is actually based out of, um, or bikepacking.com, I should say, not the, not the overall entity. <laughs> not the sport. Um, but, but yeah, but .com, they're based out of Brevard. So like this is their backyard, essentially. So, I mean, they have routes all over mm -hmm. the world, but really North Carolina, the Southeast has a, a, a honey pot of sort of their special gems and projects. I forgot to bring them. I'm, I subscribed to them. So they sent out a, a phenomenal oh, they, publication. Oh, yeah. I meant to bring them tonight, but thanks um, for bringing that up. But yeah, Pisgah, I, I would say Pisgah has more um, single track options. Mm -hmm. yeah. They incorporate a lot of, you know, if you're familiar with those trails, Black Mountain, some of the Daniels Ridge, like, you know, some of those single track options into some dirt. Um, whereas there's a lot of options over in Linville that don't necessarily necessitate hiking, uh, that keep you on gravel roads and pavement. Mm -hmm. um, Wilson's Creek, you yeah. know, there's a lot of uh, options from 30 miles to 120 miles. Yeah. Um, and up into. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a oh, yeah. similar one. One of the photos earlier was right at the CNO, the Chesapeake and Ohio towpath, mm -hmm. which goes from basically DC out to Columbia or Cumberland, Maryland. Yeah. And it's 188 miles of that exact stuff. It's an old towpath, but they have designated hike and bike campsites along there as well. So yeah. zero vehicles, a lot of hikers and bikers and stuff, but that is a a, a solely a non-motorized um, option that a ton of people do that. And that actually links up to, it's called the Allegheny Passes. It actually links all the way up into Pittsburgh. And so a significant amount, of, not all of it, but a significant amount of that is also connected via some of those rail trail style things. But that 188 mile stretch is all, all non-motorized. So you would consider that by packing that by uh, that. So, I mean, by definition, yes, because it'd be unpaved. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of coastal entry, stuff, kind too. Of an entryway into it, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, I would point you towards bikepacking.com yeah, and basically just go, they break it out by state. Um, and really, I think they have and they break it up by, two dozen. They break it up by overnighters. Yeah. Um, so they have a specific spot where they say, hey, cool, I just want to do an overnighter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they have they have a lot of different filters you can do. That's a that's a phenomenal resource to check out for sure. Yeah. I don't know that they often they, within the within the specific route them they'll tell you sort of like we suggest yeah. you know a maximum. Typically they do tires. They Tire don't necessarily size, say yeah. the bike. Yeah. Yeah. But if it's over 2.4, it's you know, yeah. it's a mountain bike. And you can see on some of those packing lists that I've created there, just kind of some basic stuff, talked about tire size too. Like the Palmetto Trail was one of them. I said, hey, you probably want a tire size this size because yeah. of some of the sand sections and all that. And you can also, Palmetto is a great space to do it too, where you can just catch certain segments of it. So mm -hmm. Sumter National Forest is uh, basically between Spartanburg and Newberry. And that's a phenomenal stretch. I think it's probably about... I don't know, along the Palmetto Trail, it's probably somewhere, like, somewhere between 30 and 40 miles of all just beautiful single trap. But you're out in the middle of nowhere, but there's campsites on either end of that. And so literally, I think when 
Jesse, I was talking about he was fixing his, uh, trying to fix his bike. That was right along that Sumter National Forest area. So that's another, you know, no, you know, there's road crossings, but you're not on the road at all. I mean, outside of just crossing over the road. So that's mm -hmm. another local section here that's, that's, uh, you know, no, no vehicles at all. Yeah, that sounds like Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a, that's a perfect overnighter. And, and some people have done it where they say, hey, cool, I want to start here, bike through, camp, and then bike back. Be a great overnighter. Mm -hmm. Yep. How, how are the road sections of the Palmetto Trail since that is like 60%? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, you know, you're in, you're cr crisscrossing literally the entire state. Um, and so you get everything, right? You get, the Palmetto Trail literally goes through uh, Columbia. So you're in like, go, you go, you, you bike towards, you know, the state, state, yeah, state uh, capital. You bike right past uh, University of South Carolina Stadium. Uh, we actually did a, a bike race with the Whitewater Center and it was basically followed that. And it was during when South Carolina beat Tennessee and I happened to be on, it was a relay, and I happened to be on that, and it was just a complete shit show. I mean, just 100,000 people roaming, you know, drunk people roaming around the streets, and we're like trying to like, you know, get through here, cops are stopping traffic. So point is, on the Palmetto Trail, you get, you know, you get some urban sprawls, but the vast majority is in rural South Carolina. Mm -hmm. So there's not a ton of, you know, there's not high volume vehicle traffic once you get out in those rural spots. Um, you know, it's a, yeah, it's tough because you're, you're literally like the Sumter National Forest is probably one of the stretches that is a, a solid stretch of just single track trail. It just bounces back and forth nonstop. You're on road for 20 mm -hmm. miles and then you're on gravel road for 10 miles and then you're on a rail trail for five miles and back on a road for another 17 miles. So it's just this constant, you know, surface change that is. Pumping up the tires. Like yeah. The tire yeah yeah so it's again it makes it kind of keeps you keeps you uh focused i guess mm. yeah well cool well, anything else uh, what's some of the advanced gear you're say it again what's some of the advanced gear you're carrying for uh, so as far as like the bags and stuff like that no i mean uh, to take care of your bike besides the oh um I, personally i don't do a lot i'm not a bike mechanic so I, I very much try to say, hey, let me do as much as I can. I'll take it to the shop, whatever it is, get it dialed in before. I know the basics of true in a wheel and like, you know, obviously switching, uh, switching tubes and stuff like that. I'm not super knowledgeable on like, you know, uh, breaking chains and doing new chain links and all that kind of stuff. So I'm, I'm on the very uh, intro level of self-sufficiency. Um, but I'm, you know, every time and any time you ride, it's it's ABCs, right? It's air, brakes, and and uh, chain, right? So meaning clean the chain, lube the chain, whatever. So anytime, I'm always doing that first and foremost, which is on that packing list. I talk about lube and even just a rag to clean out the chain. Pump obviously is ideal. You know, having CO2 and a hand pump is critical on these things. But as far as like any like major mechanical things, I'm not. I'm not super great. When we popped the tire, when the, my friend popped his tire on that, we patched it. Um, and so, you know, fortunately, we kind of trued his tire up as well as we could um, and, and limped, we were able to finish up. But um, if anything catastrophic happened, then that's, you know, we were kind of done. So yeah. If you can ride with someone who's a well-versed mechanic, big advantage. I think having those basics, on top of your normal kit, like having, they make those, you know, tools with the wrenches and the, the, the chain breaker mm -hmm. all yeah, in one. Yeah, there's one over there. Because um, having a chain breaker is, is really nice. Um, and then having a couple extra, mm -hmm. you know, quick links essentially. Um, I always carry an extra derailleur hanger. Yeah. It's light and it can save your trip yeah, <laughs> from did, a single speed that. action. We did that in Cuba. Um, I also sometimes carry brake pads, like one set. Again, it's very small. You can duct tape them together and just see, in, you see know, bombs all the downhills. And, you know, ah. yeah. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, longer trips, I carried a spoke, like on the divide. Thank God I didn't have to use it. Yeah. Um, I would say that's like worst case scenario. Yeah, that's a bigger thing. And then, like, obviously, your boots, your, you know, um, patch kits, that those essentials. And yeah, having a pump versus just CO2 is, yeah. is big. Um, 
CO2, you can still carry it, but. Mm -hmm. um, and then yes. having a threaded needle, actually, is mm. kind of one of those small pieces that can save your trip. If you have a really big sidewall tear, having a little threaded needle on top of a boot just to pull the fabrics together um, can actually be a very lightweight, you know, um, piece of kit that comes in handy. Gum wrapper, a couple staples, and a safety pin. A Snickers, a Snickers wrapper and a dollar bill. <laughs> But it's true, like even like a safety pin can be can be used. I mean not as much maybe not as for bite, but like blisters, blisters and stuff. Yeah. I mean it's just it's it costs you zero weight or space. And if you yeah. you know get a like blister a in your hand or foot or whatever or it is. something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Speaking of tires and flats, can you talk about the pros and cons of like two two less versus for bike? I can't really because I haven't I don't haven't used a tube in I don't think any of my bikes ever, <laughs> okay. which just shows how long I've been biking. Um, yeah. Not very long. Um, I think the general consensus is tubeless is better, right? Like, so that set up tubeless. Obviously, yeah. if something happens, then yeah, the tube. Obviously, you got to replace. You know, put a tube in. I think um, potentially touring could be a better tube application uh -huh. if it's road based, uh -huh. because you're probably running much higher, you know, Pressure. pressures, mm -hmm. much more traditional, you know, road slicks, mm -hmm. if you will, um, versus running, even on these, like my my gravel bike, I can run 2.2 mountain bike tires on. Mm -hmm. So at that case, I want to run lower pressures because that's my suspension in effect. Um, and you just can't do that with, with tubes to mm -hmm. the level you can with tubeless. Yep. Yeah, um, you know, the pinch flats, all of those. Um, so tubeless really hasn't come back to bite me yet. Um, I know. Uh, yeah, I would say it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty good at this point. Yeah. Um, you know, carrying and knowing how to use, you know, um, uh, what do you stab the tire with? to fix a flat. A plug? Yeah, like a plug, like a mm. Dyna plug, or a, um, having those tools available. Um, and then typically, I mean, so I suffered a, a puncture on the, on the unbound race. Snuck a plug in there, didn't worry about it for the next 200 miles, so. Um, Life is good. <laughs> yeah, I was praying. Um, but yeah, I would say more traditional touring, you could probably argue for uh, tubes, but I think bike packing off surfaces when yeah. you're, especially when the volume of tire starts to get bigger, um, that's where I would start to seriously I say think, tubeless is. Uh, part of it depends on what your weight load is too, right? Like, true. you know, the Pennsylvania ride, I was, I was 50 all in with bike and gear and it's like, okay, that was, that was a lot because of, you know, I, that was a week. But it depends on, you know, if you've got a full, you know, if you're talking significant weight, then that could obviously impact what kind of tire pressure you want to run. And then conversely, it can impact, you know, yeah. whether you want to run a tube or not. I will say whether or not you are tubeless, um, I always carry tubes. Oh, yeah. You know, 100%. because if, if my patches don't work, if my yeah. boot doesn't work, 100%. I'm putting a tube in at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, so they make lightweight tubes, but at the end, yeah, it's one of those safety things. That's that, what Jesse was trying to put in in that photo was a lightweight tube. One of those yeah. uh, tube of lights things. Mm -hmm. Those things yeah. are crap. <laughs> yeah, that's why we were, that's why um, we had to hitchhike. But yeah, I, so that's, that's <laughs> one of my backups for sure because you're not getting anywhere on, on yeah. just the rim. All right, thank you guys for tuning in. Hopefully you've learned a couple things from today's Recreation 101 session. Uh, before we sign off, we are here at Recover HQ with Bill Johnson of Recover. Um, huge thanks once again for them to, uh, to support this whole series, as well as give you the tools, knowledge, and understanding to get out and enjoy nature in different ways. Yeah, well, first off, thank you for, for putting this on uh, in Human Power Movement, but uh, thank, thanks to all of you who, who mm -hmm. participated in, uh, and took part in Outdoor Rec 101. Um, being the title sponsor is really important to us as a brand. Um, you know, as we talk a lot about sustainability, we really think of it as really the constant pursuit to do better. Mm -hmm. We're always trying to improve yeah. our systems, the way we do things, and just give more people access and exposure to, yeah. to do things the right way. And we yep. feel like Outdoor Rec 101 really speaks to that. Mm -hmm. So 
we're really excited for for all these new outdoor enthusiasts who've uh, who've been completed the the class and uh, and look forward to, to seeing you guys out there. Um, so so thanks again for putting it on and, and thanks to all of you for participating.